This podcast is an invitation to feel and experience the souls of famous old Hollywood homes and to have an in-depth journey to the areas where they're located through interviews with longtime residents. Either you're a fan of old Hollywood in Los Angeles planning to have a vacation or an even bigger step, considering a certain area for your future home. This is your opportunity to receive valuable information and insightful advice you won't find anywhere else. Hello, hello, and welcome to my podcast. Are you in the mood for California? Today, we'll feel and experience the history of live theater in Los Angeles, featuring an interview with incredible Christian Telesmar. I thought I came to LA just to do film and TV, but I quickly found myself realizing film and TV is not predictable. Mm -hmm. So you, something a little more predictable is there's more theaters out here than studios, and you are more likely to get a job performing on stage than you are <laughs> performing in a film or a TV show. So I'm so glad I found the theater community here because it has you know, fulfilled so much of my heart in, in terms of creativity. And one of the things I noticed is that I do enjoy the, the sense of like, when you're on stage, you're performing one show that night, for a specific audience and you never no no one will ever see that performance again mm -hmm. you know it's the it's the, it's the first and last of that performance you get a chance thankfully to do it again the next day you know and multiple times throughout the weeks until it officially closes but every day is like a new day Masha Korpacheva is a California-based realtor and a member of the National Association of Realtors in Los Angeles. She's an advocate for selling and buying homes with soul and practicing mindfulness in real estate. With master's degrees in spiritual psychology and linguistics, Masha brings all of her skills to work with her clients. An intuit and empath, she has touched many lives with her outstanding ability to see beyond the visible and helping to come to better understanding of issues and their resolutions. An adventurous world traveler, from climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania to exploring the Galapagos Islands, Masha has a particular passion for the City of Angels. Having landed in this paradise and adopted it as her home, she's been sharing old Hollywood stories since 2007. In the mood for California, feel the soul of old Hollywood. And now, are you ready to experience the history of live theater in Los Angeles? On a balmy evening in June 1911, a fresh buzz of excitement filled the streets of downtown Los Angeles. The city, home to just over 300,000 residents, was on the brink of experiencing something extraordinary. Amid the throngs of people, fewer than 10% arriving in their own automobiles, anticipation built as they approached the grand opening of the Orfeum Theater. This new cultural gem stood as a beacon of entertainment in a city where Hollywood was still a quiet village and motion pictures were silent. As the heavy doors of the Orfeum swung open for the first time, the scent of fresh paint and new upholstery mingled with the electric atmosphere. Inside, a world of opulence awaited. Glittering chandeliers, plush velvet seats, and intricate architectural details that transported patrons to a realm of glamour and sophistication. That night, as the curtains rose and the vaudeville performers took the stage, their film theater marked the beginning of a new era for live entertainment in Los Angeles. Fast forward to 1931, Another significant year in the city's theatrical history. The Los Angeles Theater, a lavish movie palace on Broadway, made its grand debut with the premiere of Charlie Chaplin's City Lights. Chaplin himself had reportedly helped finance the theater, 
ensuring it was a masterpiece of design and function. While primarily intended for films, its stage, orchestra pit, and dressing rooms allowed for a variety of live performances from vaudeville acts to dramatic plays. Over the decades, the Los Angeles Theater became a cherished landmark. Its elegant facade and richly decorated interior, a testament to the golden age of cinema and live performance. Nestled in the scenic Griffith Park, the Greek theater added a different flavor to the city's theatrical landscape. Built in 1930, the first performance took place in June 1931 with the attendance of 4,000 people. This outdoor venue was selected for its natural acoustics, creating an ideal setting for musical and dramatic performances. However, its early years were marked by sparse usage, and during World War II, it served as barracks. Despite these challenges, the Greek theater emerged as a beloved venue known for its enchanting ambience and memorable performances under the stars. Beyond these iconic theaters, Los Angeles nurtured a vibrant live theater scene through a multitude of smaller yet equally significant venues. The Matrix, Colony, Victory, East-West Players, Company of Angels, and the Odyssey Theater Ensemble each contributed to the city's rich tapestry of cultural expression. These theaters became incubators for new talent, offering a stage for innovative works and fostering a sense of community among artists and audiences alike. One cannot discuss Los Angeles theater without mentioning the remarkable stories that unfolded within these historic walls. The Orfeum Theater, for instance, hosted stars like Sarah Bernhardt, Al Jolson, and the Marx Brothers, who captivated audiences with their charisma and talent. The theater's evolution from a vaudeville house to a palace for musical comedies and variety shows reflects the dynamic nature of Los Angeles itself, a city always in motion, always embracing the new. The Broadway Palace, another jewel in the city's theatrical crown, underwent multiple transformations. Originally, their film, it was renamed in 1926 and later became the News Palace in 1939, showcasing news reels and documentaries during the tumultuous years of World War II. Each name change and new focus mirrored the shifting tides of entertainment and the world at large, making the theater a living chronicle of the city's history. The Globe Theater, originally known as the Morosco Theater, is another example of Los Angeles' adaptive spirit. Over the years, it morphed into the President Theater in the 1930s and the News Real Theater in the 1940s. Each iteration brought new life and new stories demonstrating the resilience and versatility of Los Angeles theater scene. What makes live theater in Los Angeles so special is not just its historical significance or the grandeur of its venues, but the stories of the people, both famous and unknown, who brought these spaces to life. From the early vaudeville days at the Orfeum, to the star-studded premieres at the Los Angeles Theater, to the serene performances at the Greek Theater. Each show has woven its own thread into the rich tapestry of the city's cultural heritage. In Los Angeles, live theater is more than just a performance. It is an experience, 
a celebration of creativity and community that continues to thrive. Whether under the bright lights of historic theaters or in the intimate setting of smaller venues, the spirit of life theater in Los Angeles remains a vibrant and essential part of the city's soul. And here we are. Welcome to Los Angeles. I'm so happy to have Christian Telesmar here with me. Christian Telesmar is an educator, entrepreneur, and actor on stage and screen, best known for his work in NCIS LA, The Young and the Restless, and Animal Kingdom on TNT. In theater, his work has included, on the other hand, We Are Happy by Def James at Rock Machine Theater, named Best Production of 2022 by both the LA Times and the LA Drama Critics Circle, and the lead role in Radio Golf by August Wilson at a Noise Within Theater, for which he received a 2024 NAACP Theater Award nomination. He lives in Sherman Oaks, California, and is an LA local board member of SAG After Actors Union. Please check out his Instagram at I am Telesmar. Christian will share with us what it feels like to live and pursue a career in acting in Los Angeles. Hello, Christian. Hello. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And I'm so glad you found the time in your busy schedule to have this conversation with me today. Well, of course, I'm happy to do it. (laughs) So, Christian, could you share what your journey was like uh, moving to Los Angeles and how did you actually decide that Los Angeles was the right place for you to pursue your career? Well, I moved out to LA in 2014. So it's my 10-year anniversary was like two weeks ago. Wow, congratulations. I know. I think I can officially call myself a Los Angelino now. Yes. But I moved out here right after grad school. So I pursued acting pretty much out of college. Um, and I'm originally from the Northwest. So I'm from Portland, Oregon. Um, grew up in Vancouver, Washington. If you know Vancouver, Washington, then you might know Camas, Washington, which is where my family lives now. Oh. But that's basically a small town of a smaller city of a, next to a metropolitan bigger city. Okay. And okay. I moved up to Seattle for college, went to the University of Washington. I studied a pre-med and microbiology at the University of Washington for four years. Oh, my God. And then on my fourth year, I decided to not go to medical school. And that was after spending like six months on a Kaplan pre-med exam course. Finished that course and was registered for my MCATs and decided not to do them. I can go to that story maybe another time, but pretty much I had like an epiphany, epiphany moment, a moment where I was watching a play in Seattle on campus of the grad school program. And I just noticed and I saw the grad students who were older than me at that time who were committing their life to acting because they were taking it seriously as a grad degree. And all the fears I had of pursuing acting kind of went away. I realized, you know, if they're not afraid, why do I have to be afraid? Because I just had this whole fear of like, you know, I couldn't pursue acting, couldn't pursue the arts as a career path because it wasn't sustainable. It wasn't something that you do. I just assumed passions like were hobbies and acting was a hobby Mm -hmm. and you don't make careers out of hobbies, which we all know is not true today. But, you know, back in 2004, that was definitely, you know, my mindset. So back then when I started college, I was basically focusing on going to med school and University of Washington has a great med school. So I went to University of Washington and then I did four years of pre-med and microbiology. And then right before I finished, I realized I don't want to do any of it. I still love healthcare. I'm still involved in terms of uh, health and wellness in certain ways, but it's not my as passionate as I am about performing arts. And so all that changed in undergrad. I went to grad school two years after graduating undergrad, got my degree at the University of Washington, got my MFA, my master's of fine arts. And then it, we do this thing where we do a tour where the grad students tour. We do it in Seattle, of course, but then we also do it in New York and LA. And we just perform a showcase. We're basically a prepared scene with your classmates. It's about a 20 to 30 minute show. You do a, a bunch of scenes. And we did it in New York and then we did it in LA. And I got, I, I was thinking about New York because I love theater, but LA was way more receptive to me. I had way more meetings out of those showcases in LA. And I ended up dropped, you know, hitting the ground running here. And I decided this was the best place to be. Yeah, and 2014, I moved to LA. 
uh, and I lived in my car and on my friend's couch for about 18 months. Wow. Until I found the place I live now, which is Sherman Oaks. So I've been in Sherman Oaks since 2015. Oh my God, what a journey and so brave, Christian. This is incredible. It was, and then to know that you're coming to the city where every other person is literally an actor or pursuing acting. And then yeah. with such competition, having the guts to make this move and to live in your car and on your friend's couch, you know, this is incredible. That takes a lot of bravery. Thank you. I, I know a few others who have done the same. And I think, you know, it's not a, I don't know if I would be able to do it today. You know, I'm a much older person now. <laughs> my body needs more comfort, but I'm glad I took advantage of my youth when I had it. And I uh, definitely am happy about it. I don't have, I have no regrets. Right, right. Well, this is what passion does for you, actually, yeah. because when you're really, really passionate about something, there is nothing that can stop you. Like you do not think about any competition or financial difficulties, whatnot. You just go for it. And I think that proves that you were just meant to be an actor and you meant to live in Los Angeles. Yeah, I agree. Intentionality is everything. Yeah. As long as you're intentional, you know, so many things start aligning for you. Yes, yes, very true. So, and you mentioned uh, that you now live in Sherman Oaks. So what is it like? Do you like Sherman Oaks? And is it more special than other neighborhoods uh, in Los Angeles? I guess I'm biased because I have lived here for so long, but I do enjoy Sherman Oaks. It's just a, a, a wonderful place to live. It's a beautiful community. It's right next to both the 101 and the 405. So if you're in LA, you know what those mean. That's pretty much two different freeways. Yes. One goes mainly vertically up and down north and south, and then one goes, you know, east to west, but it does bend down north and south once you start going further. But um, it's just right at the pin pinnacle of both of those. So I can pretty much hit any studio, any um, casting office pretty easily because I could hop on one of those two freeways right out the gate. And so that's been a big perk for me and why I like it out here. But the community is so nice. Everyone has a dog. I can't have a dog. I have roommates and mm -hmm. we all have different lifestyles. So we can't really make a dog work. But I love just being able to go for walks. Yes. See their dog. Say hi. I take my neighbor's dogs for walks too. So I do get my my dog fixed that way. Um, it's just such a nice community out here. So I really like it. Oh, okay. And uh, do you have some favorite spots maybe in Sherman Oaks? Maybe some stores or coffee places, restaurants? Yeah. Um, some of my favorite places, I'll say the places I frequent the most. There's a place called a Tipsy Cow, which is right, right off Ventura. And Ventura is a really long street. So pretty much closer to, um, you know, Van Nuys area. Mm -hmm. There's a place called a Tipsy Cow which is a nice uh, cafe, restaurant. They have great fries. I'm going to say this because everyone knows this, but In-N-Out is something I just enjoy a lot. I, I mm -hmm. use, <laughs> take my time with eating In-N-Out because I do, I can enjoy it too much. But since it's so close to my home, that's a big perk. That, yeah, there's a, literally In-N-Out up the street from me. But one of the smallest places that I think is one of the best places to go to if you have a time just to sit down and eat is called Panzanella mm -hmm. Restaurante. It's an Italian restaurant right off in tour as well. And it's just a nice quaint place. It has a lot of like the old school restaurant decor. During COVID, they usually had a lot of seating outside, which they never had before, which was so nice because they had lights out there. I don't know if they're still doing that. I haven't seen that in there the past couple of weeks, but two months ago they did. And it's just really nice to have, uh, you know, a martini mm. go there. Nice pasta, um, their protein dishes, like their steaks, delicious. So like, and they're great with cocktails. They're just so great with cocktails. And so mm -hmm. that's just a nice place. Um, that's literally walking distance from my home. I, me and my neighbors actually go there together sometimes. So I would say that is probably a perk. And if you're looking for some fun, I would say the one up, the one up is like a arcade slash restaurant. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of old school games like Asteroid and all these things. And you could basically like have some, like some good wings a beer, and then play some arcade games and just hang out without having to leave. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. And I also actually liked um, that earlier you described, you know, Sherman Oaks being in between these two freeways. And in a way, you know, the way Los Angeles is spread out, that there is really no heart to the city, but maybe <laughs> the right. heart is in Sherman Oaks. 
you know, <laughs> just between those two, two yeah. freeways. The heart is where the freeways, you know, cross paths. That's right, exactly how right. Look at it. <laughs> and like somewhere in between, you find your neighbor's dogs to walk and get a martini, you know, with some exactly. friends at a restaurant. So yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, it's really, it's really quaint. I like it. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about your acting career. And uh, I actually was very lucky to see you in one of the plays in uh, a small theater in Los Angeles. And it was called On the Other Hand, and uh, it was quite remarkable, I must say. And it was a very, very touching uh, play, and it really stayed, uh, you know, within me, in my heart. And uh, so uh, you also mentioned that oh, living in Sherman Oaks, it's easy for you to get to different studios. So you obviously do both theater acting and you uh, act in movies as well. Mm -hmm. Could you share a little bit more about the difference between theater acting and acting in movies? You know, one of the biggest differences I'm experiencing personally is they, they both have a lot of the same things. So I think the biggest difference for me would be just the level of intimacy you approach mm -hmm. your performance and how you interact with your scene partner or your uh, the characters on, on stage with you or in the scene with you. You know, if you can imagine, like, if you're standing on a stage in, like, a 600-seat theater, it's different than you know, being in a room with a camera that's like two feet away from you, mm -hmm. you know, they mm -hmm. both have a lot of the same fundamentals in terms of preparation in my mind. But in terms of your performance, that's I think that's the biggest difference is, you know, your performance shifts because, you know, I, I would talk to you differently if you're two feet from me than if you're 30 feet from me. Right. Mm -hmm. And I still need to make sure I'm producing a, a sense of intimacy. So that's why I use the word intimacy, mm -hmm. because even though you're, you know, 20, 30 feet away, I still need to make the environment or, you know, present the relationship to be intimate so that you can feel connected just as much as if you were two feet away. And instead of feeling like I'm like projecting or yelling at you, I'm still having to build a, a performance that is intimate. I just have to make sure I'm carrying my body. So, you know, if I want to get technical with it, there's literally vibrations and resonances throughout your whole body. And you're really trying to activate those just like singers would or opera singers or anybody would when they're performing in a big space. They are activating certain parts of their body, which help to produce more resonance and more volume. And that can still carry when you do that, when you do it naturally that way, it still carries a sense of intimacy, even though your volume has increased. Um, and so I think that's the, the biggest difference is the techniques shift once you start performing is that you're starting to use your instrument differently and your body is your instrument in that sense. I would also say... In some ways, I love the differences between both, and I'm a fan of both. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought I came to LA just to do film and TV, but I quickly found myself realizing film and TV is not predictable. Mm -hmm. So you, something a little more predictable is there's more theaters out here than studios, and you are more likely to get a job performing on stage than you are <laughs> performing in a film or a TV show. So I'm so glad I found the theater community here because it has, you know, fulfilled so much of my heart in, in terms of creativity. And one of the things I noticed is that I do enjoy the the sense of like when you're on stage, you're performing one show that night for a specific audience and you never no no one will ever see that performance again. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the it's the, it's the first and last of that performance. You get a chance, thankfully, to do it again the next day, you know, and multiple times throughout the weeks until it officially closes. But every day is like a new day. Mm -hmm. And for someone like myself, I really enjoy that mindset because sometimes when you perform something and you're not really happy with it, for whatever reason, it could be because you're in your head it, because, you know, it just didn't feel right for whatever reason. Maybe you get another chance tomorrow. Right. You get another opening night and closing night tomorrow in that sense, you know. So that's the cool thing is that you're always working on something. You know, maybe you're working on a certain technique one day or a certain character attribute or personality trait like you're always working on the character because you're still trying to discover what's going on theater allows you to discover the character every performance and it's not and as an artist you that's kind of what you love to do you love mm -hmm. to just dive in and investigate and learn more about the story learn more about your character and what does that mean and if that character will never exist beyond you in that sense because it's not just like the written character it's not just you as the human being it's a combination of the two and therefore that combination is so uniquely made when you step on that stage and it doesn't exist anywhere else so it's kind of like a lot of like onus you get a lot of onus walking on stage because it's all you and you get to make it what it is you make the best of it and sometimes the worst of it is a part of you too and that's a beautiful thing to kind of jump into every day mm -hmm. with film you just do it you you go in there you do the best you can within the minutes you have to shoot that scene or that shot or that setup. 
And that's it. You don't have to do that ever again. <laughs> Likely, you don't have to do that ever again unless they have like some technical issue. You have to do some reshoots, which is, you know, sometimes happens, but it's very rare. But you don't, wow. you don't get a chance to go back in. So it's kind of like I'm gonna put everything I can because I know I'm gonna get a chance to do this once. And you can take more risks in that sense too, if you want to look at it, that kind of freedom. Mm -hmm. So what is more challenging for you, movie or theater acting? Ooh, I think they're both challenging. Like they're both had their so separate, they had their separate challenges. It's almost like, you know, people use this apples and oranges, but it's like mm -hmm. literally like, what are you in the mood for that day is maybe mm -hmm. like the challenge. So like, let's say, let's say if I don't have much, as much time to prepare and work on something, I think the challenge in film is greater because I don't get another chance to go back in there. Mm -hmm. So I have to like rely on my craft instead of like, you know, character description, uh, the character development I built on. I had to write on like some techniques and some skills to help maintain the story. Mm -hmm. rather than being able to like develop like delve and like a small very specific type example could be like you know maybe there's a fight scene or an argument or there's some sadness I might have to lean on some te technical skills with my craft to produce that for mm -hmm. the character on film because I didn't have enough time right. to develop that internally to have that ready to go um, but with theater if I'm not there that one day rehearsal that one day in that performance I get another try I get another day so it's not like you you know it's not like a one-off type thing so that's kind of like I love them both for that reason, but those are the differences and the challenges. I think the biggest thing with theater and the challenge is that you can't do a retake with that audience. You know, people right. see you, you forget a line or you mess up. You can't stop, really. I mean, you can, but it's not really, a, there's not a convention for it. So it really it does change up. And you're really riding, I call it riding a wave in theater. That's the biggest challenge with theater. You're really riding a wave and you don't know what that wave looks like. You know how to surf. You, ha you know your board very well, but you don't know what the waves are going to be that day. So you're really just jumping on that stage and you're riding the wave and the wave is the audience. The wave is the script. The wave is the play. The wave is your body. If you're sick or if you just, you're not, you know, warmed up enough, your mouth might not be functioning the same way it normally does. And you just can't get the words out. There's like so many things that you're riding and every moment you're just attentive to it. And maybe it's something that was hilarious to the audience yesterday. No one said anything. No one laughed today. And you're like, that's the wave today. Okay. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to make sure I'm still staying on the wave and not losing the momentum of the story there's like so many more things to pay attention to continually with theater and i love that as a challenge right wow what a beautiful description i actually got chills when you said that uh, acting in theater is like riding the wave because you know for me as you know one of the audience members who loves going to the theater quite regularly it's the same experience that uh you know when i choose a play i don't know what i'm jumping into and right. uh, sometimes i really enjoy it and i can get very emotionally you know impacted by the play and by the connection with the actors with the script you know mm -hmm. and with the you know other members of the audience and uh, that's actually very different in different theaters the way i have experienced it but it's always kind of like jumping into the unknown. It's like, okay, what will, yeah. what will it be like tonight? You know, because you pick the theater, so you'll have to stick with it. <laughs> yeah, that's something I remember when we first met. You were telling me about that that you like to see a lot of theater, and some of the shows you don't look up what they're about beforehand. Do you? I do. I do look up okay. what the do shows you the, are you read about. The bios? Yeah. Do you read well, the bios I don't know. I do not read the bios. No, but I do read okay. the uh, what the show will be about because I prefer psychological uh, shows, something that mm. I can actually learn from. And right. psychology and human connection, this is something that I'm very partial to. So I would usually pick shows that, um, you know, have some very interesting plot to them. So, right, and, right. and I love classics as well, just, you know, for the sake of general education, I think we should all know classics. And uh, I love um, seeing classics as well. Yeah. Yeah, I love them too. And I think, you know, some amazing theaters out here that do a combination of both. So that's why I love LA theater for that reason. Right, right. And what's unusual about LA that very few people know is that LA is such an incredible city for theater because nobody mm -hmm. ever thinks uh, about <laughs> LA this way because everybody is a movie theater. You know, it's the movie capital of the world. But uh, there is such incredible theater uh, that I have personally experienced. And sometimes it will be at the smallest, smallest, like little venue. Yep. And there will be like maybe 20 people in the audience. But then the play will be so incredibly touching and deep exactly. and so professionally, uh, you know, put together that it was like, oh, my God, how come like exactly. no, more people, you know, came to experience it? Exactly. Yeah. So and first of all, yes 
Yes, uh, Christian, thank you so much for doing theater and actually for doing such incredible, you know, theater work. So I really appreciate oh, thank what you, you do. So. Well, thank, thank you for coming to theater. I mean, I wouldn't be able to have a job to do it if you didn't come see it. So. <laughs> People like you and patrons who just love to come to see the to see performing arts. Very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. So I have a very, very interesting question to you. Um, is acting or your acting skills and everything that you have studied, is it in any way helpful in your life, in your regular life? Mm, that's a great question. I mean, it's undeniably, yes, that's the answer for me, for sure. And thinking about how... It has most impacted my life. I think this might be very big and very deep at the same time, but rejection is really hard for me. And I know that everyone has their own level of rejection um, and dealing with rejection. And we, you know, we receive it and start dealing with it at a very early age, depending on the home we grow up in. And performing arts is, especially as a career path, is all about rejection. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, in tandem, it's about conquering fears. Mm. And those are the two things that I think performing arts and acting has showed me the most is one, how to conquer my fear. Sometimes the fear is fear of rejection, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the fear is the fear of being seen. Like yes. sometimes just being scary to, to be seen and to be seen by strangers sometimes is harder than to be seen by family, but sometimes it's harder to be seen by those who you love the most than to be seen by strangers. It all depends on the scenario, but it's just to be seen and when you go on stage or you're doing a film, you have to allow yourself to be seen. Mm. I think the best performances in acting I've seen on stage and in film personally as an audience has been when I got to see that human being on screen or on stage. I saw them. And it may have been a glimpse. It may have been for an extended period of time. But it's undeniable when we see a human interacting and behaving naturally and authentically. It's undeniable to us. We just have this ability to see it and it's subconscious for us to see it as an audience and we connect so so much more quickly to the story to them to the, the the message when we're able to do that so personally it has helped me one to be be okay with rejection two just to be able to conquer fear and accept fear and be, i'm not really trying to remove fear but my life i realized you can't remove fear yeah um yeah. it's more about courage in the end and courage doesn't exist without fear. If there was no fear, then you wouldn't need courage. You would just do things. So being courageous is something I've learned from performing arts as well, just living my life courageously as much as possible. And ultimately, the goal is to be seen. And it's so scary to be seen or heard um, because you don't want to be criticized or judged or outcast from that. But um, being brave enough to, do, to allow that to happen allows those who are loving and accepting of who you truly are to find you. And those are the people you need to be around anyways. Those are your community anyways. So it's almost like you need to be seen and, and put that beacon out there so that you can find your home and people can find you as their home. And so that's the fear. It's like a weird catch-22. It's like you're scared to do it because you don't want to be alone. But when you do it, you end up finding your home. And I just did that. That was a poem. That's really the, the biggest thing for me. Wow. Wow. Yes, you did create a point. That is incredible. <laughs> that was a little poetry <laughs> right yes. there. Wow. Christian, and... <laughs> Do you think this fear dissipates when uh, you actually start seeing yourself? Seeing myself internally, or you yes, think like... in internally mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. You know, because oh, man. I think it's yeah. like maybe it's first that you have to be able to have the courage to see mm -hmm. yourself before you even show yourself to others. I totally agree. It's like self development is a big part of my life. I'm I'm so I get so activated around self development and that's a big word. There's so many categories for that. But really it's around identifying who I am because the more I'm able to identify who I am, the more confidence I find in myself. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost like you hear the term, like, be your own best friend. You know, you need to know who you are so you can be friends with them and you can protect them and you know how they work and how they move and how they live their life. And you are they. So, like, you need to learn more about yourself. And one of the best things about learning about yourself is not really trying to change yourself into the person you want to be mm -hmm. officially trying to, but are really trying to love the parts, the version of you that you don't like. It's not really about changing the things you don't like as much as it's like loving the things you don't like. And while you love the things you don't like, you may grow into better things, but you may not. And it may not be as quickly as possible, but you still feel loved. You still are loving yourself regardless. And I think that's the most important thing with, you know, growing and developing and reflecting on yourself internally is 
finding the love for yourself of where you are right now yes. and actually yeah. loving the person you were before when you first had those traumas or you first had those insecurities form you need to love that person too that child in you that you know that inner you who didn't get love back then that you're trying to run away from i think it's the best for us to face them and love them just the way they are just mm -hmm. the way they were and then continue to develop who we want to be as we go forward but the loving ourselves as we are and who we were is I think the best form of acceptance and uh, healing that we could give ourselves. A hundred percent. Yes. I totally agree with you. Yes. So Christian, my next question, mm -hmm. uh, you wear many hats. So you're not just an actor. You're also an educator and entrepreneur. And uh, yes, you are very big on self-development, as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. How do you actually balance these different roles? <laughs> Um, depending on the day, I don't, but, um, <laughs> just being honest, you know, what I found to do is, um, I found that as long as I'm following my overall mission, like I'm kind of building, like, so like, as you said, there's a lot of hats I'm wearing in terms of my background with performing arts and theater and getting my master's in that. I also got my master's in business administration. And so I kind of like, it's hard for me to separate the creative from the structured or the creative from the business and the, and in the entertainment side. That's why I think I love being a part of this industry because it is a combination of both. But what I've learned is that it's not one or the other. It's really like one day it's a little bit more of this one. The other day it's a little more of that one. And I'm noticing that the best way I'm able to find some structure in my life is some of the basic things, mm -hmm. like literally just making a to-do list. I have this thing called a daily compass, which is basically a spreadsheet and I'm a spreadsheet nerd. And it's basically, you know, what I want to accomplish that week and if there's new things that arise, because there's ideas flowing in my head all the time, there's things I want to try or things I want to explore, but I can't always do it in the same moment, right? And I think I had to learn to hold myself back from just jumping into something that I'm excited about right away and putting that on a list of things and just seeing what my priorities have to be. So for me, it's more about priority for me. Yes. Um, it's not really saying yes or no to something. It's that balance for me is just organizing your life to have priorities so that you can get the things that you need to get done. Like things that require you to pay your bills. <laughs> you need to focus right. on those, even though your passion towards something might not pay your bills right away. It may be more of a long-term thing and requires more attention over, over a span of time. And you may want to jump into that right away, but you might need to focus on some other things. So for myself, I've been talking to myself a lot about one, structuring my day so ahead of time so that I'm not taking my uh, going off of a whim of passion in the moment because <laughs> I'm right. very prone to that sometimes. Um, and then if I do do that. The great thing about it is I can look at my daily compass and be like, oh, I have time to do that. I have time to just go off that whim right now because I have my day open or I, I set some time aside for that or I don't have as busy of a schedule today as I thought I did. And I'm able to fully engage into that whim in the moment because I, I, I can have confidence around understanding my schedule around all of it. So that's a big thing. And then one of the other big things is just meditation. Mm. Meditation has really changed my life. And meditation means so many different things. So for me, it's basically a, a moment of silence where I'm just able just to focus on the present. And I do that mainly by just listening to my breathing, feeling my breathing going into my body and exiting. And then, you know, just like not, not trying to maintain any thought at all. And thoughts are not, you know, something we can control. Just like breathing, it's involuntary, so to speak, right? So it's more of like, it's not about controlling the thoughts. It's just like, you know, letting them come in and go. And eventually they, you know, they become secondary instead of being the primary thing on your mind, which they always are primary if you're not allowing time for something else to take over. And meditation allows for that something else to happen, that silence to happen, that peace to happen. And I find so much more energy and my dopamine cravings for like, like my app, like Instagram swiping or something is lessened once I get done meditating because like I've gone through a, a process of like chilling out all of those you know, desires. And now I'm able to focus a lot more easily. Wow. That's absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. So, uh, Christian, my final question to you is, of course, about advice to aspiring actors. Uh, maybe, you know, <laughs> um, you know, some of my listeners are some mm -hmm. of those people who mm -hmm. are actually <laughs> considering uh, a move to Los Angeles. What would you um, suggest they should do? Is there any advice that you can give to them? I mean, I could give a whole, you know, college course on, I have taught college courses on this, but. They'll have um, to sign up say, for it. <laughs> I know, don't have, those, you have to sign up for that. Let, I can put it briefly in, I think. I'll start, I'll start this way. I think also a lot of people's goal when they come to LA is to jump into TV and film, 
whatever reason you want to be on TV and film, it doesn't matter. It could be, I don't, I don't have any judgment towards people. The goal of why you want to be on TV film, it's a good goal. If you just want to be seen, if you just want to be praised, if you want to be a celebrity, that's not a bad thing. I don't think there's anything bad about that. But there's so many other things that lead to that. And if that's not a strong enough passion for you, you need to find a strong enough passion for you to stick to the, the stuff that that takes that leads up to all of that. And I think that's what's most important. It's like, what do you, why do you really want to be in LA? Why do you want to be an actor? If it's just for, you know, glamour and attention, that and that you feel like that's a strong enough drive to push you through a lot of decades. And that's I didn't mean that accidentally. I mean decades of work before you get there. Then fine. That's great. You have a passion for something and you're working positively and constructively towards it. But if you if you feel like that's not going to be strong enough to keep you going, you need to find something deeper than that. Is it performing? Is it just, is it art? Is it creativity? And you can get a lot of that stuff without acting in LA. Mm -hmm. um, you can get a lot of stuff without acting, period. There's a lot of other creative outlets that could probably feed you creatively without having to be acting. I know so many people who came out here who are actors and now are directors and they're wonderful directors um, who are stage managers and they're wonderful stage managers. So like, I'm not telling you not to come to LA. I'm not telling you to not pursue acting. I'm just saying being open to asking yourself the question why mm -hmm. so that you can as you go through the the difficult path which for me i'm in technically i'm in year like 14 of this path as a career since i left college but it's more of like professionally and this has been like something i'm pursuing like gung-ho it's been more like no actually no it's been like 14 i think i made that decision i was gung-ho right away so it's been 14 years of me like hitting the pavement three yes. of those years i put in my 10,000 hours in grad school and then after that i still spent another 10 years after grad school doing this and I'm not even at the place where I could say I'm fully uh, comfortable to say, like, I have a career tomorrow, you know, right, it's right. a long shot. It's a marathon. So my best advice is to prepare. The best thing you do to prepare is take classes. You'll always need to take classes. I'm always taking classes. Even if I'm not, if I'm not on stage in theater, then I'm trying to perform somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So try to so accept readings, do play readings, do your friend's pilot reading, do just find ways to interact and engage and work that muscle as much as possible. Your headshots, your agents, your, your demo reels, all that stuff is going to be useful. But if you don't know who you are as a performer, if you don't know what your, your talents are, you don't know what your skills are, you don't know what your craft is, you know, you're, 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 you're working on all the things to get you a job, but you can't do the job anyways. So I would say one, pace yourself. Uh, the industry is not going anywhere, even though sometimes it might feel like it. It might feel like it's going away, but it's not going anywhere. AI won't take it away, I promise. I just don't know how long it will be here or how substantial it will be, but AI is not going to be replacing anything anytime soon. So take your time, learn the craft, learn why you love the industry, why you love the performing arts. And then if it's not LA, if it's New York, if it's not acting, it's stage managing, you will still be involved and we need every aspect of that. So yes. you'll be a part of the community regardless. Yes. And Christian, can you say in one sentence, why do you want to be an actor? I love telling stories. Mm, that's beautiful. That's very beautiful. And Christian, thank you so much for sharing the story of your life and sharing the stories about acting and how you got into it and all the challenges that you have learned to overcome while acting in theater and in film and sharing your story of living in Sherman Oaks. I really <laughs> appreciate uh, the time. And, well, thank you. Uh, you know, thank you for being such a good storyteller and continue pursuing your passion. Well, thank you very much. It was great talking with you. Thank you, Christian. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Thank you very much for tuning in for the experience of Life Theatre in Los Angeles with my special guest, Christian Telesmar. If you enjoy my podcast, In the Mood for California, please sign up for future episodes at your preferred platform and please leave your feedback. I really appreciate your time and support. You can follow me on Instagram at In the Mood for California and check out my website, www.inthemoodforcalifornia.com. I'm a realtor with Beverly & Company Luxury Properties, and my license number is 019-78714. Selling and buying homes with soul is not just my real estate strategy. It is an intuitive and holistic approach that embraces your values, aspirations, and conscious intentions. 
If you want to discover the power of mindfulness in your real estate journey with my compassionate guidance, I'm here for you. In the next episode, we'll dive into the psychology of a Lay's residence and explore how living in this dynamic city shapes their perspectives and behaviors. Prepare for an engaging and enlightening adventure. Cannot wait to share it with you. In the mood for California, feel the soul of old Hollywood 